last week we had reports of some very dramatic things that took place. And according to George Gallup Jr., who was on this program with us, his surveys and research in America indicate that there's seven and a half million people in America who testify to some type of spiritual healing. And yet all of healing is a mysterious and unexplainable event. Why do bones knit together? Why do we uh, grow back a fingernail if it gets smashed? Why do some people recover from cancer and others don't? Well, what happens in the healing process and how does God intervene in it if he does intervene or how is it done uh, naturally? Well, uh, Nita Edwards is here with us and she experienced one of the most phenomenal healing of our day from almost total paralysis, Nita was healed instantly after an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. She's from Calcutta, India, where she's working uh, in a hospital over there now, her home formerly in what's called Sri Lanka, or what we used to call Ceylon. Would you please welcome to the 700 Club, Nita Edwards. <laughs> so glad to see you again. The last time was in East Berlin, where we went to that little church, and you gave your, your, your testimony. The first time I'd ever heard it. Oh. Nita, go back and, and tell us about your condition. You were the child of a well-to-do family, an educated family in Ceylon. You were attending a private school in India, uh, and you were, a, you were playing uh, girls' hockey, soccer? Oh, what? yes. All of those hockey, all right. You were good at it. Oh, yes, I enjoyed it. All right. Well, Nita, tell us in your own words what happened in that school when you had an accident. I fell down a flight of steps and uh, tumbled all the way down. It was brass-plated steps, so as I slid down, I severely injured my spine. It was the lower lumbar spine that was injured, and I was paralyzed, neck downwards, to the tip of my toes. Well, now, it didn't happen right away. You pulled yourself up, uh, by, uh, you had these pains, but you didn't think it was anything too serious. No. Having been an athlete for several years, I thought it was just another sprained bone joint somewhere, or pulled muscle, or torn ligament. Mm -hmm. Didn't take it seriously. But uh, as the weeks went by, I found that I was losing equilibrium, couldn't walk, and uh, there were several other conditions which were giving me sufficient cause to take it seriously. Well, actually, you had, you had smashed your lumbar vertebra then, and you didn't know it. No, I had three prolapsed discs in three my... Three pro prolapsed discs? Yes, and uh, I was very determined to complete my final examination in mm -hmm. the university there, so I worked hard trying to ignore it and continue preparing for my exams. In fact, I was down appearing for the exam when I had to be carried out at the end of it when I couldn't walk at all. And you still didn't go to a doctor. They, they compelled me to, yeah. finally, and I did. And uh, they gave me wax baths and diathermy and uh, finally checked my spine. And that is when they realized what had happened. Well, Pat, from that point on, my moments as a normal, healthy athlete were gone. Well, of course. Well, you were very brave. You must have been under intense pain all this time, and yet you continued to, to, to fight against it. I confess I was. Uh -huh. I was determined that I wouldn't give my mother an opportunity of saying that I um, paid more attention to sports than my studies, you know. Uh -huh. I was sent there by my parents to study, so I didn't want to lose track of that. But however, at the end of it, when they discovered my spine was so severely injured, and at, by that time, within a couple of weeks, I was totally bedridden. I couldn't walk, couldn't move, couldn't breathe. And well, what other treatment do the doctors give you? I mean, it doesn't sound like it's all uh, that serious, but, but, but you went from there into total paralysis. Oh yes, I was totally paralyzed and confined to bed. I couldn't even move on my own bed. I was in a plaster cast, hip downwards to my toes, in bilateral skin traction. And this would tell you clearly how severely injured the spine was. My foot end of the bed was elevated about three and a half feet. And I was on bilateral skin traction with 45 pound weight attached. That's and at that awesome. elevation, it's a lot of weight. Well, well Nita, if, uh, could you, I mean, if you'd gotten immediate medical treatment, would it have been different or, or would it have gone ahead and deteriorated that way anyhow? There were complications, Pat. My kidney was damaged, 
and uh, I was hemorrhaging. Mm -hmm. There was also an inflammation that had set into the spine, which was diagnosed as a myelitic condition, which is more common, prevalent in the Asian countries. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know at which point in my illness this was introduced, this condition, but that caused a total paralysis, and thus I couldn't move at all, I couldn't breathe, I had to be on a respirator, I had severe, well, several heart uh, failures and uh, attacks. I well, the, at that point, the prognosis was really deterioration and death. You couldn't have lived in that condition much longer, is that right? No, that was after a period of eight months in hospital. Yeah. I was um, told that I would never walk again. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, at that point, I had to bribe my special nurse to pick up the bed tickets and let me take a peek into it and it was frustrating to know that I would never ever walk again mm -hmm. but worse news was still coming and that was that my days were numbered that I would not survive more than eight weeks eight weeks now when you say survive you mean live as on this life you were going to leave and die and 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 did well, now what came over your mind then were you were you afraid or, or, or what happened when I was told that I could never walk again, the first thing, and I noticed, I was very deformed, Pat. Mm -hmm. My hands were all curled up like this. My feet were curled up. My mm -hmm. legs looked like the hockey sticks I played with, skin and bone. Mm -hmm. I had a How much did you weigh? To 79 pounds. 79 pounds. I don't look like I weigh 79 <laughs> now, do I? <laughs> look just great now, but I mean, before, the, uh, it's just amazing that, that you couldn't, of course, you couldn't digest food. Everything wasn't no, working. No, I couldn't eat food, not even yeah. the good English chocolates I'm so fond of. Uh -huh. I couldn't digest food. I couldn't swallow. I couldn't even speak. I lost my vocal powers. I couldn't even communicate with my family verbally. Of course, having been with me for over near at the end of my illness, they became experts at lip reading. Yes. I could just move my lips and they would sometimes get it right, sometimes wrong, but... Well, now, uh, during this time, what about hope? Well, seven years before the accident, the day after my 13th birthday, I suffered a tremendous tragedy in my life. That was the loss of my own precious dad. Mm -hmm. He was my best friend. And when my dad died, it took me some time to accept the fatherhood of God. As a child, many people comforted me and consoled me by telling me that Jesus had taken my daddy to heaven. So I didn't like this Jesus. <laughs> but after about four years of trying to live a good life and make it on my own without this Jesus ever helping me, I found that I was kicking against the pricks. So I decided that I would give Jesus a chance in my life mm -hmm. and made him the Lord of my life. And today, Pat, 12 years later, I have no regrets. Praise the Lord. Praise He's been faithful, a friend, and a loving father all this while. Well, Nita, let's get into the time when something miraculous happened, because you're obviously, you didn't expire after five weeks. You're still here in radiant health and serving in a hospital uh, situation. I might show you some pictures, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Nita is working along with a gentleman uh, known to us named Mark Buntain in, in hospital conditions in Calcutta, India, where she is serving uh, thousands of, of patients uh, in their in their moment of, of need up there. A very lovely girl from a very prominent family, but she says, listen, I, what happened to me is my life counts for something else. Well, now, somehow, Jesus came to you in this hospital. Can you tell me about what happened? Yes. I was at the tether end of my wit when I was told that I would never make it back on my feet. Of course, first I thought I wouldn't be able to get back to sports, but that was only a minute part of it. Mm -hmm. Later, when I knew that I was dying, I still turned around and said, well, even if medical science can't help me anymore, maybe my Jesus can. The Jesus that walked the dusty streets of Judea, the Jesus that healed the blind eyes, the Jesus that raised the dead. Mm -hmm. Maybe he can help me. And I kept crying out to the Lord, even during the time I had 11 medical specialists from all over the world treat me. I kept saying, Jesus, I know you can raise me up. Please, Lord, raise me up. But after eight months of crying and pleading with the Lord this way, there were two months that followed when I was really 
at a point of trial, I remember praying and saying, Lord, I've suffered enough. Won't you take me home to heaven? But then came a stage in which I began to say, Lord, I'm not going to tell you what to do with my life. Mm -hmm. I gave my life to you, and now you're the boss of my life. Let me know what your will is for my life. What is your purpose, your plan for creating me in my mother's womb? Reveal that to me. And that was my only question at that point, Pat. It was, of course, one year since I've been in hospital at that time. And perhaps my, I made a covenant at that point with the Lord. I said, paralysis or no paralysis, I'll live for you, Lord, to my last breath. Praise God. Now, you might think, well, no big deal. You didn't have too much to lose. After all, you were only a paralyzed, deformed, crippled girl. In fact, even my face was distorted that you could not have recognized me at that time. But in my heart, deep down within, I felt that I needed to surrender it all to the Lord. Simply let go and let God take hold mm -hmm. of it all. Mm -hmm. When I did that, I really expected to hear from the Lord or to know from the Lord what His plan was know how I expected to hear. I didn't have that part of it. I thought it was his problem, but I was sure that the Lord would communicate and tell me what his plan was for my life, and sure he did. Several weeks and months went by. It was the fifth day of January, 1977. Right. I had spent one birthday in hospital. I had spent one Christmas in hospital, and now the new year dawned, and it was a dark and gloomy new year. Mm -hmm. But five days later in the new year, the fifth, it was around four o'clock in the afternoon. I was not asleep, wide awake as I am now. I was lying on the bed, still unable to move, unable to breathe, unable to do anything, hooked up on machines, life support systems in the intensive care unit. I had been several months. Mm -hmm. But at this point, it was in the same condition mm -hmm. when I heard an awesome voice speak to me. It was a soft, gentle voice. But, Pat, I have never, ever heard a man speak with such authority in all my life. The Lord spoke to me and said, Nita, I will raise you up from this bed and make you a witness to Asia. Nita, I will raise you to make you a witness to Asia. He didn't stop there. He even told me the day, the date, and the time he'd come into the room and raise me up. What did he tell you? The 11th of February, 1977, Friday. Friday, the 11th of February, 1977, you knew it was the voice of Jesus. There was no question about it. I that. knew it was the Lord. I asked for confirmation and had it too. And I was seated waiting. The Lord permitted me to share this with only four people. One was someone you would know, Brother Andrew, God's smuggler. Yes. One, was the, one of the pastors was praying with me at that time. And the other was my Buddhist special nurse. Of course, she didn't get to be a Buddhist special nurse any longer. Uh -huh. In a short time, she quit being a Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> but out of that time of waiting, I just c had a wonderful time communicating with the Lord, telling him my fears and my anxiety. Well, now, did you, you declared this. You told your special nurse yes. that on February the, uh, what was the date again? February the, the 11th. February the 11th at, at uh, the time of the afternoon. No, I didn't, it, know, the you didn't know the time. I knew the day the date. and the date. All right. But I sat in my wheelchair, I remember one day as she was making my bed, preparing to put me back in there. I had to be strapped in the wheelchair to keep me from tumbling out of it. I had been praying and waiting on the Lord, and I said, Lord, you told me the day and the date. Mm -hmm. But re I remember you had told Betty Baxter even the time. Lord, don't keep me waiting all day. Tell me the time you're going to come into this room and touch me. <laughs> and he did. He told me the time. What it was, was the time? I didn't hear a voice yeah. at this time, but deep down in my heart, in my spirit, I knew it was going to be 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon. Three? And I believed it with, as well as I knew my name. I knew my Jesus was going to keep and, his and, and, well, Did you announce it? You told your f mother and, and others that, that to no. be there? Or you told your nurse? I had my mother, some friends, the pastor and his wife, and two medical doctors who had treated me in the state hospital who knew my prognosis to be present there. I didn't tell them all, only four people the Lord permitted me to share it with, but they were all present, seven witnesses around my bedside God. when my Jesus came in. 
But before I get into this, there's something that I heard when I was in East Berlin that uh, apparently there was a, a, a man, a missionary in, uh, in Ceylon who was praying 20 years prior to this, and God revealed to him the faces of, what, four people? Eight people, Eight people who he said were going to be chosen by him to reach India for Jesus Christ. Eight people. He saw seven of them during the next 20 years. He met them. He knew who they were, but there was one face of one girl who had not been seen. He had never seen her. He did not see her. Apparently, in Nita's confinement, she was not able to look out the window and they placed a mirror by her uh, bed so that she could see the reflection and see out uh, to see something going on outside of her room. A makeshift television. Uh, oh, it was a, t huh? a makeshift television. It was a makeshift television. <laughs> Natural television. And this man happened to be in that hospital going in or out of the hospital. He looked up at that mirror and seeing the reflection, he saw the face of the girl that God had revealed to him before you were born, or at the, at the time of your well, birth, approximately three and a half years old. Three and a half years old, but but he when saw he had when he had the vision, it was you uh, as a, a, a twenty-three year old girl. But Pat, I wouldn't have known what it was going to look like twenty years later. My parents wouldn't have, but my Jesus knew what it was going to look like. <laughs> oh, it's marvelous! All right, this. Uh, Mark Buntain has written a book with Ron Hembry uh, called uh, The Face uh, in the Miracle of the Mirror, and he tells about that story. But that man came in, and he was involved. Uh, what was his name? The, the, Colton. His, Colton, Brother Colton. Brother Colton. All right. Now, they were all there. Now, it, it was 3.30 in the afternoon, February the 11th. Everybody, and you had two doctors, two your Buddhist doctors. nurse, your mother, a couple of pastors. Colton was there? Yes. This yes. man who had seen you, you and his vision 20 years before, and they're all standing around the bed. Yes. Then what happened? The first thing I did that morning was I asked my nurse to, for the time. Now, I hadn't bothered about time. Day or night was the same to me for so long. She told me 6 o'clock. I was waiting. 7, 8, 9, 10. I was just eagerly, anxiously <laughs> waiting for my... Like oh, a decade. It was like eternity. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember 12 o'clock came by and I had my last bed bath. I told her to set the time to Radio Sri Lanka time. Now, I can't explain why I thought God's time was Sri Lanka time, but uh, that's what <laughs> we happened. We think it's American time. Everybody... <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> but she set the time and I had my eyes glued on the clock, just waiting. 12 o'clock, I had my last bed bath, and at 2 o'clock, oh, I even told my nurse to set my shoes, my slippers, by my bedside. At 2 o'clock, these people who had requested to be present came and knelt around the bedside. They shared a, the word, and they knelt down to pray. I still couldn't move, but I had asked to have regular, normal clothes on, since, which I hadn't had for over a year, in anticipation of what Jesus was going to do. I lay in that bed still in a helpless condition, but not hopeless, waiting for my Jesus. Was there any question? You were convinced in your mind that at 3.30 you were going to jump out I of I was bed? positive. Okay. I knew as well as I knew my own name that Jesus was going to come in because right. he had told me that. And he came, it, they all came in and knelt around my bedside. And Pat, I was raised in the Church of England, mm -hmm. very conservative Episcopalian. But I had been spirit-filled a few years before, and at this time, I just couldn't keep my mouth shut. I, praises were just peeling out of my lips, out of every pore on my skin, just thanking Jesus for what he was going to do, mm -hmm. thanking him in advance of what he was going to do. Yeah. Suddenly, the whole room filled with the power of God. I've had electrotherapy for over a year, Pat. I know the power of electricity feels but I know power far greater than that power, and that is the power of my Jesus. The whole room was filled with the power of Jesus. It was like a million volts of current flooding through my body. Every cell, every fiber, every muscle in my body came alive under the power of God. The bed that I was lying on began to vibrate. The milk was already on. Suddenly, from the right-hand corner of my room, there was a huge, big ball of fire that was just a glowing light. It was blinding. It was like a hundred sunshines all at the same time. And the whole glory of God just invaded the room and filled it. All those present in the room saw it. And suddenly, 
I remember checking the time 20 minutes after 3 o'clock. I became oblivious of the presence of the people or where I was, except for one thing, the presence of my Jesus. Yes. He came into the room. I saw him, Pat. Just like these years have heard his voice, I saw the Lord step into the room. It was a blinding glory of Jesus as he came to the foot end of my bed, touched me one time, and I was thrown out of that bed, <laughs> catapulted out of that bed. And the next thing I knew was I landed on the cold, hard ground as my knees touched, hit the ground. Knees that had never been bent for over one year were now bent before the King of Kings. Hands that had been lying lifeless and limp were upraised, praising Jesus, the Lord of Lords. A voice that had been still for so long came alive to say, thank you, Jesus. I live for you to my last breath. I was instantly and completely healed by the miracle power of Jesus. And today, it is four years, six months, 27 days, <laughs> and about 20 hours since my <laughs> Jesus raised me from my deathbed, and I give him all the glory for what he has done. That is the most glorious thing. That is the most glorious thing. We have a glorious God. <laughs> Nina, what could you tell somebody that's watching right now and, and is sick or in, in pain or in trouble? That same Jesus who touched you would touch them. What would you tell them? Friend, we have a God who's not a partial God. What he has done for me, he can do for you. All you need to do is to trust him. Trust him without any reservation. Let go. Let God take over. He is able to give you that miracle you're waiting for. The power is available, for Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is that same miracle-working God. Let him prove his power in your life today. Praise God. I think we ought to pray right now, ladies and gentlemen. I, this is one of the most extraordinary testimonies. I heard uh, Mark Buntain, a well-known, um, uh, respected missionary, share this uh, with Nita when I was in East Berlin, and, and she was there for Berlin for Jesus. It's a glorious experience, and I think we should pray right now because you have needs, and the same Jesus that came in uh, to her and touched her would touch you as well. And uh, Ben is going to join us and maybe we could just uh, stand right now, uh, Nita, and we'll join hands together. And, and Ben, for that glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Father, Thank ladies and gentlemen, wherever you happen to be right now, just join, if you would, around your television. Those in the studio, join hands together. The same Jesus that walked into that hospital room in Sri Lanka four years ago can walk into your hospital room today or into your home today and can do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. We stand in awe of what has been shared by our sister from all the way around to the ends of the earth in Ceylon. And Lord, we ask you now, the same God, the same Jesus, the same Lord who touched her would touch others right now. Lord, you're a God of power and might, and there is nothing impossible with you. Now, Father, there are those on beds of affliction right at this moment. There are those, oh God, who are struggling and suffering financially. They have insoluble problems. They have cried out, oh God, help me. Now, Lord, would you be gracious, and would you touch them, and would you enter into their life that they might know your mighty power in the name of Jesus? Receive an answer in the power of God.
Do you need a makeover? Have you ever watched a makeover show on television? As for me, what I really enjoy is watching them remodel and decorate a house that is in shambles and transform it into something modern and beautiful, customized to the needs of a needy family. Then there are the dental makeovers, where people get beautiful smiles. And also the people makeovers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 to 10, we read, We are like clay jars in which this treasure is stored. The real power comes from God and not from us. We often suffer, but we are never crushed. Even when we don't know what to do, we never give up. In times of trouble, God is with us. And when we are knocked down, we get up again. Now the question is, are we ready for a makeover of our lives? Even when our lives are filled with conditions that are not ideal, Paul the Apostle encourages us to loving attitudes and holy actions. Through these attitudes and actions, we seek to carry out the ideals of our Heavenly Father. When the going gets tough, or we have to face encounters with difficult people, our first reactions generally reveal who we really are, the metal we are made of. Ever had some young teenage driver cut you off when entering the highway? What was your reaction? If an assistant at work or your mother-in-law corrects you, what is your first reaction? What were some of your reactions to annoying folks you met along the way today? Which of your attitudes or behaviors need a makeover? I remember when I desperately needed a makeover in my life. As a young university student, after an accident, I ended up paralyzed, neck down to the tip of my toes. Unable to move, unable to breathe, unable to eat, speak or even see, I remained in a hospital bed for almost a year. During that trying time, when all hope was crushed, my goals and my ambitions were torn down to shreds. There I lay, flat on my back helpless in a hospital bed. It is a good place to be when you are lying flat on your back. Do you know why? The only place to look is up. Allow me to share with you some lessons I learned during that time. The Apostle Paul demonstrated for us in the passage we read what characteristics need to be a part of the life of a believer in Christ Jesus. In this way, we can reflect or mirror Christ-likeness to others. He warns us to be alert about any triviality that may obscure God's fullness or best in us. In other words, we are to focus on maintaining our lives open to God. So the portrait of Christ is clearly seen in you and me. Even when our circumstances are rough beyond words. In the midst of criticism from others. While facing suffering, pain and loss. Oswald Chambers suggests, Never, never, never let anything obscure the life of that is hid with Christ in God. As we allow the Creator God to work out a makeover in our lives, we learn the highest Christian love is not devotion to a certain noble cause or good work, but 
dedication to Christ, the Master himself. Causes and works are good, but love for them will fail us at some point. So let us remember, Jesus identified himself with the Father and laid down his life as a servant of his Father. Thank God for the opportunities we have in our walk of faith to identify ourselves with the Lord's interests and plans in moulding us into the men and women He wants us to be. 2 Corinthians reminds us, Companions, as we are in this work with you, we beg you, please don't squander one bit of this marvellous life God has given us. God reminds us, I heard your call in the nick of time. The day you needed me, I was there to help. Well, now is the right time to listen. The day to be helped. Don't put it off. Don't become partners with those who reject God. How can you make a partnership out of right and wrong? That's not partnership. That's war. Is light best friends with dark? Does Christ go strolling with the devil? Do trust and mistrust hold hands? Who would think of setting up pagan idols in God's holy temple? But that's exactly what we are. Each of us a temple in whom God lives. God himself put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapters 6 and 7. I live in them, move into them. I'll be their God and they'll be my people. So leave the corruption and compromise. Leave it for good, says God. Don't link up with those who pollute you. I want you all for myself. I'll be a father to you. You'll be sons and daughters to me. The word of the Master God. With promises like this to pull us on the journey of life, dear friends, let us make a clean break with everything that defiles or distracts us, both within and without. Let us make our entire lives fit and holy temples for the worship of Creator God. Today, will you invite Almighty God to perform a makeover in your life?